that you think maybe so this again in Karlstadt actually 2004 yes book on some aspects of quantum groups that was maybe 95 Okay, thanks to the organizer for the invitation to give this presentation. Um, I was asked to talk about stuff that I have been doing. So actually, uh, much of this will be rather old stuff. I will start by some uh, generalities about various things, continue with, again, generalities, but specifically about topological defects. And then the main part uh, will be how these ideas here, this is, this is all uh, uh, completely heuristic, but then I will be uh, concrete how this is realized in two-dimensional rational conformal field theory. And um, Leah, you, you can think of, of this as an introduction to the two talks you have heard yesterday. Um, Liang, Li, Liang mentioned here uh, papers from 2001 to 2006. Actually, I would say up to 2010, roughly. So this is old stuff. The experts who know this can just relax and do something else, but maybe stay in the room. So just in case uh, there is anything of interest to them in this. And then after the break, uh, I will say, uh, how you can go, go beyond, still uh, essentially staying with conformal field theory in two dimensions, but going beyond rationality in, in, in uh, various ways. So uh, let's start uh, with one. So we want to say, uh, we want to talk about symmetries. Uh, symmetry means that there is some stuff, some some uh, things that we want to transform, but certain interesting things uh, should be invariant. And in quantum field theory, uh, we would say a, a symmetry, there should be some action on uh, certain fundamental quantities, and we have to specify them. Leaving invariant specific interesting uh, quantities. So uh, concretely, uh, this is uh, 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 rather easy to say. There is some, there will be some concept of correlators or correlation functions. And what they are precisely will depend much on the setting and uh, also what the fundamental quantities will uh, depend much on the setting. And uh, in this first part, I will just uh, try to be very general so that I don't have to specify this. So fundamental quantities in the first uh, place will certainly include fields. And uh, say in, in, in some a quantum mechanical uh, based picture. This could be operator value distributions, but I will not talk about anything uh, like that. Uh, just uh, assume that there is something we call a field and uh, we will think of them as in some sense local, meaning that they depend on the position on, well, uh, some something we would maybe call space-time, but it's for me a misnomer because uh, and typically there will not be a metric. And if there is a metric, then it will not be Minkowskian. Uh, but still, maybe I, I will use this term. And uh, so there should be something that may uh, should make sense of that. And then traditionally, uh, that's what people uh, try to describe. Uh, but we, we uh, meanwhile know uh, there, there is more, 
in particular, we, in fact, do not want to look at a single space time M, but maybe some family, and this will include in particular uh, 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 manifolds, uh, which uh, can have a boundary, and then on the boundary, we want to specify boundary conditions. I said manifold here, I will take, uh, I will assume, and it's an assumption, that space-time is a manifold. Actually, it will be something slightly more general. Um, but that, that is part of the setting that I will always use. Now, when we have uh, allow for boundaries and boundary conditions, uh, then uh, we should also allow for co-dimension one defects. So if this room is our space-time, uh, here, uh, the wall is, is, a, is a boundary, but we know the world is going on on the other side, so this is actually an interface, so an internal boundary, so we should allow for that. But then on this wall, we can think of uh, uh, one-dimensional uh, interfaces between two different regions. So, ah, co-dimension one. Uh, because of that, uh, uh, we can think of uh, having defects on defects and then defects on these. This would be uh, in, in this three-dimensional uh, room here, uh, a zero-dimensional. And actually, we can think of fields as insertions, which are just zero-dimensional defects on a one-dimensional defect, which might be invisible. Um, so, uh, in a sense, uh, we uh, can summarize all of this by just saying we have uh, defects of any dimension. And that means that M, in fact, will not be a manifold. It, we can technically take it as a stratified manifold. But then there are actually also uh, different uh, at the technical level, no of that, but we, we will not need any details about that. Now, what about uh, correlation functions, uh, cor correlators? Uh, we think uh, that that uh, um, we can consider, can consider configurations on our uh, manifold M consisting of arbitrary types of defects. On the defects, just like on a boundary, we have to specify boundary conditions. We have to specify something we would call defect condition. And we have certain fields. And to this, uh, to a specific one of those, we associate a number. Uh, and then we say this number should depend in a nice way on where the fields are located, what uh, s some aspects of where the uh, defects are located, and also if we have a family of, of, of manifolds here, it should depend uh, in a nice way on uh, the modally of, of that manifold. Of, the, of that family, and we would say we have a correlation function if it's really a function of all those parameters. Yes. Ah, uh, I I have. Uh, did you understand? Yes. No. Uh, if if we have diff if if we have a collection of fields, they will uh, uh, will be uh, inserted at uh, distinct points. We can, of course, uh, look what happens to a correlator when points coalesce. But I'm considering uh, distinct points, and uh, and uh, maybe we we discuss separately what happens uh, otherwise. 
uh, but I can say a little bit about that when we are in, in part three. Uh, so um, now about uh, am among the defects, uh, there are in particular what uh, people call topological defects. And let me write here definition in quotation marks. I will use definition uh, several times. It will always be in quotation marks, but uh, I mean uh, with this that it's possible to make these things concrete, at least in, in part three in rational conform field theory, but also in many other theories. So a topological defect is characterized by uh, the fact that uh, correlators or correlation functions do not change when smoothly deforming the defect. Here I have to say a few things more. When I say topological defect, I really mean a defect as a, a submanifold, uh, but uh, with a given defect condition. Uh, so, so this is about really about defect conditions. And when I say smoothly deforming, uh, in part of uh, as part of my setting, I assume that the, they are actually submanifolds. Uh, uh, so, P is in uh, in a, a, a specific technical sense, a stratified variety, uh, and I deform them only in such a way that they do not hit any other relevant structure. So, do not hit. Uh, fields uh, and field insertions and, and do not uh, coalesce with, with other defects. And now the nice thing about topological defects, and this brings us to, to part two already, is uh, that uh, you can do uh, various, well, you can imagine that you can do uh, various things with them which you cannot do uh, with, in general with, with uh, arbitrary defects. One is you can fuse them. So I have here two short line defects. Uh, if they are topological, I can uh, deform them and I can look what happens if they are close together. If I look from far away, this will look like a single defect. So there is a fusion product. I have two defects, uh, let's call them uh, D and D prime. Then there is some kind of product uh, so uh, that D uh, fused with d prime is again, is again a defect of this well they should have this uh, in in uh, maybe i should say here of the same dimension you can also uh, look at what happens if uh, say a one dimensional defect uh, moves into a two dimensional one that would be more complicated than uh, i uh, i'm i'm not uh, considering this here uh, then you could hope that there is some kind of semi-simplicity uh, so that there would be a collection uh, of defects di uh, such that every other defect is in a suitable sense a direct sum of those uh, and in this case you get what you call fusion rules you look at the fusion product of uh, two of them and uh, this will be equal or isomorphic uh, to a sum of, direct sum of uh, uh, those. You have only these decays, but they can appear several times. So you have a certain uh, multiplicity spaces uh, or the general spaces uh, in, in general. Um, then uh, you can also fuse a uh, co-dimension one defect uh, to the boundary simply to a, bound to a boundary simply uh, because the boundary is just a special type of uh, co-dimension one defect uh, where on one side you have something and it, but it's the end of the world there's nothing on the other side um, um, 
concerning uh, what they, what these things are in in concrete settings, uh, I should warn you uh, they need not be what what you would naively uh, ma uh, maybe expect, just like like uh, relevant fields. So if you have a parameter, uh, if you have some description of your theory, say in terms of some Lagrangian uh, boundary conditions, will typically not be specified by giving values on the boundary for uh, for for the fields that you find in your Lagrangian. And then another uh, thing you might uh, be able to do is uh, create them out of nothing. Uh, maybe at the expense of a non-zero number in correlation functions. So uh, uh, that uh, concretely, that would mean uh, you 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 start with with nothing, and then you insert, say, a, a, a dimension one defect on uh, a two-dimensional uh, defect. Actually, defects in in the applications that I have will always be oriented, but I will will suppress that uh, to save some uh, time. Now, if you can create them, uh, afterwards you can deform them. So, for example, if you have some uh, uh, some some field insertion somewhere. And now you have created uh, your defect. Say uh, this is on a sphere. I don't have a spherical whiteboard here, so. Uh, uh, but just imagine you move this around uh, the sphere because it's you're allowed to do it because it's a topological defect. Uh, then it will end up like that uh, uh, and shrink them. So you will end up with a situation where the defect encircles your field. Of course, this works directly if you just have one field. Uh, and then again, looking from uh, uh, far away, uh, you will uh, think of this as an, just a new type uh, of field. Well, one of the other fields that you should uh, already have in your theory. So that means that uh, uh, there is an action of, of, a, of those topological defects on the collection of fields. Now, among the topological defects, there are special types. Oh. There are in particular, there is one type, well, you hope there is one type, uh, which you would call the invisible or trivial uh, defect. So uh, this would be a defect, let's call it D0, such that the fusion product uh, with any D in uh, any order uh, just gives back you, gives you back uh, your, your defect. Uh, and again, you have this in principle in any dimension. I will mainly talk about two dimensional theories, so there will, uh, the, the important defects will be one dimensional. Uh, in itself, this is not so interesting, uh, but uh, it becomes directly interesting when you now define an invertible defect. I call it just D. And then uh, we, say, uh, we require that there exists a D prime such that the fusion product of D with D prime gives us the invisible defect. And also in the other order, I don't write that down. So that means, for example, um, if you uh, have your defect D and your defect D prime, uh, uh, defects will separate different phases of uh, of your theory. If 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 this has maximal dimension, uh, I, I call the uh, the if if I am in dimension n, then the n-dimensional strata will 
uh, still be defects, but I don't call them like that. Uh, I call the corresponding defect conditions phases of my theory. So this might be in a phase A, phase A prime and A double prime. So this is a defect changing phase A to A prime, and this is one changing uh, A prime to A double prime. If they are invertible, uh, then we can think uh, we, 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 by deforming them and using the fusion product, we can uh, get a situation where we have uh, actually, if if it's invertible and D is an A A prime defect, then D prime must be an A prime A defect. Uh, so we have a phase A here and we have phase A prime here. And um, then finally, I consider something I call a duality defect. Again, I call it D, and I uh, require there exists a D prime such that the fusion product of D with D prime can be written as a direct sum of D, say, sum over alpha with labels alpha i, and all these alpha i's, um, no, sorry, and uh, all, uh, let me just write uh, D alpha, where all of these are uh, invertible uh, defects. And um, in uh, that situation, uh, you can again uh, uh, do some manipulations with fields, uh, but I will not describe them now. I will directly uh, uh, start with, with the uh, part three and then show what happens in, in that particular case. No, this would, uh, an invertible an invertible defect is a duality defect where on the right-hand side I have just one term uh, and uh, that would be uh, the invisible defect. Okay, so but D-prime has to be a direct sum. Um, in, in, in all cases, I know, yes. Um, because in uh, well in in those cases that are relevant there is some kind of rigid duality and then d prime uh, will in fact be uh, the dual of that and in the tensor pro in the fusion product of a, an object with its dual uh, the tensor unit always appears but at this point i don't really assume that but Yes. I I said this. Yes, uh, it's um it will it will not uh, be important uh um for the two-dimensional case, because two-dimensional manifolds uh, in uh, the, their smoothness is 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 not so important. You you can also. Uh, uh, look at piecewise linear manifolds and get the same results, but in higher dimensions it will be it will be relevant, and I have nothing to say about it. I, I'm assuming that uh, for uh, well, I, since I will not talk really about higher dimensions, I uh, I'm not supposed to be able to say something about uh, that. But uh, certainly, if you if you look at defects in higher dimensions, you should uh, you should be aware of the fact that if you make the assumption that they are okay, that they are smooth uh, submanifolds, then this is an assumption. And you can ask what happens in more generality. Ah, no, because I uh, uh, because uh, when I uh, say I have stratified manifold, of, of course strata of the same. Uh, 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 dimension can meet at uh, 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 a uh, at, at a submanifold uh, of uh, of one dimension lower, and those I would uh, well uh, 
uh, I, I, there are two ways to think of it. Uh, one is via fusion, so we can put uh, two of them together, but then more. Uh, but uh, you can also say uh, here you have a, a generalized field insertion. And that's actually uh, the more attractive uh, way of describing them. Well, one uh, one uh, one way uh, of of dealing with them is blowing an absolute infinitesimally and thinking of a field insertion there. And actually, that's uh, uh, the way you uh, you implement that, for example, in uh, in in certain string net models. Uh, but about those, I will not talk, at least not in this first part. So. Part three, two-dimensional rational conformal field theory. Um, I will try to give you a definition in quotation marks, which of course will suppress a lot of things. Uh, and also I would, would claim that this is my definition, uh, the, the, the setting that I'm using. Uh, I'm not sure whether there is a universally accepted definition. Uh, but uh, in any case, there's one point I want to uh, emphasize, and this is that there are two variants, namely chiral conformal field theory and full conformal field theory, and I will uh, try to say a little bit about that. So what is the chiral CFT? Uh, for the moment, we, we don't talk about rational yet, and everything will be two-dimensional, so I don't talk about, uh, uh, we'll, we'll not repeat this all the time. So uh, we first have to say, what is the relevant uh, space time, M? Uh, this is a complex curve. So a complex one dimensional manifold uh, with a, 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 a complex uh, structure. Uh, and uh, then uh, we can ask uh, uh, about space-time symmetries. Well, uh, what, I, what I actually uh, forgot to point out is uh, that the reason why I'm uh, presenting these things at, at this conference is that uh, we can we can ask what are uh, symmetries, uh, uh, and uh, one in an operator uh, uh, picture, you could say there is some unitary operator which acts by conjugation on fields and leaves the Hamiltonian invariant and, and things like that. Uh, again, uh, I uh, will uh, not uh, use that, uh, but I will use something which uh, people nowadays uh, uh, know that at least many of these symmetries you can realize with the help of topological defects. And I will uh, discuss uh, essentially only those, but there can also be uh, uh, symmetries which I do not describe in that way, and these are there in, uh, in, in, in conformal field theory. I call them chiral symmetries. These correspond to a vertex operator algebra. Let me abbreviate it because I will say it a few times, uh, which I just call maybe A. Uh, and uh, then uh, the fields in this situation will be uh, just A modules. And um, you can then uh, ask um, what is a, a fusion product of fields? Is this defined indeed? Uh, on uh, uh, modules over vertex algebra, you can define a tensor product. It's not a, 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 an easy definition. It's uh, actually um, uh, rather different from how you define uh, tensor products in other situations. Um, for example, uh, the vertex algebra uh, uh, the modules over the vertex algebra has, uh, have fixed values of the relevant central charges, in particular the Rosoro central charge. And if you if you now uh, ten, take a tensor or fusion product of them, you have to preserve that, and that uh, uh, you wouldn't do naively. So uh, uh, it, uh, this is complicated. But I will not talk about chiral uh, uh, conformal field theory. So. Uh, 
Uh, I have, I, I will not say more about that, but in any case, there is some kind of tensor product. And then you can think uh, in terms uh, uh, of uh, inserting these fields locally uh, on, on some points on your complex curve. Uh, and uh, then um, uh, look at uh, correlators as uh, suitable uh, vacuum. There's a, there's a vacuum vector in, in, in A, uh, uh, expectation value of tensor products of uh, uh, those fields. These are not just the uh, tensor products as A modules, but you have to take care of where they are located. Uh, so there uh, is, uh, uh, again, an additional step you have to make. Uh, but in any case, there is uh, then a uh, uh, global action of your vertex algebra uh, on fusion products, uh, on, on correlators, which are uh, uh, expectation values uh, of suitable fusion products. And all of this, uh, uh, working this, uh, uh, spelling this out would uh, would would take uh, most of the time that I have for this first part. So I will not uh, even uh, uh, give a hint on that. Uh, but the important thing is uh, that uh, then uh, uh, that concretely this gives linear differential equations on the correlators. Uh, maybe maybe I give give one hint here uh, uh, by an example. Uh, we, in in so-called Wessemino-Witten models, uh, you have A uh, obtained uh, from some untwisted affine Lie algebra based on uh, uh, some finer dimensional simple or maybe semi-simple uh, Lie algebra G. And in this case, uh, this global action is via, uh, is an action really of the algebra uh, G tensored with functions uh, on uh, M uh, minus uh, P, where, where P vector means uh, the, the points, the distinct points at which my fields are uh, inserted, which are holomorphic uh, on, I should write here, which are holomorphic of on M uh, 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 away from P and at P have only finite uh, order poles. Uh, and um, now when you have these differential equations, you will have spaces of solutions vector spaces of solutions, and these are called chiral blocks or also conformal blocks. But as I uh, said already, this is not what I uh, really want to discuss. I uh, want to talk about, well, which one could call uh, local, and it has uh, to, to, to have a distinguished name, it has also been called full or full local conformal field theory. And in this case, I have a different setting, but I had to introduce chiral uh, CFT as a first stage because I will use that uh, in my uh, description now. Uh, and uh, this is that uh, in this situation, my space time will be a world sheet, term coming from string theory, um, which uh, is just a two dimension, uh, a, a, a conformal surface. What, so, this is a two dimensional manifold with a conformal structure. A conformal structure is an equivalence class of metrics um, uh, with respect to uh, conformal rescalings. Uh, I will also assume that this is compact. As a consequence, uh, the metrics, except for genus one, uh, that I can uh, consider uh, are necessarily uh, Euclidean. So uh, therefore maybe, well, also in a string theory context, it would not be good to call this space time again. So therefore we have this separate name. Um, now, um, the idea 
uh, is now to uh, take a chiral uh, conformal field theory or maybe two copies of it and in string speak uh, combine uh, or free field, free boson uh, theory uh, uh, language combine left and right mirrors. And this is obtained uh, as follows. Uh, we um, use the chiral uh, conformal field theory on a manifold. Now I'm uh, use, using bad notation. I use M here and M here. Maybe I call this M tilde. And uh, uh, what I'm using now is a chiral conformal field theory on a complex curve M tilde, which is of a special type, namely it's M hat, uh, which is called uh, uh, complex cover or orientation cover of uh, M. The point here is that the conformal structure together with an orientation gives, us, gives one a, a complex structure. Uh, so uh, if I uh, just look at the orientation bundle over my manifold, uh, uh, then I will get a complex curve and I can look at chiral conformal field theory on that. By the way, uh, we do not require that uh, there is uh, no boundary uh, and uh, also uh, it's not necessarily oriented whereas by construction M hat is oriented as a, a two manifold. So this means in particular that locally, um, I at almost all points of, of M, uh, M hat, uh, we look like just two copies uh, uh, of of of, an, uh, of some neighborhood in in M, uh, and uh, since on this I have a chiral conformal field theory, it follows that for bulk fields, I will have two. Let me call them chiral labels, uh, X and Y, where um, uh, X uh, is just an an A module. Uh, and um, actually, on one of the uh, copies, I will have some vertex algebra, say, A left. On the other hand, uh, I will have a, in general, different uh, vertex algebra, A right. If they are uh, completely different, I would have a heterotic situation, and I will not talk about this. I will use uh, only the situation where this is a left, essentially. Let me just write a, a, a left ref and explain this later, this reverse here. This is true for bulk fields, but uh, over the boundary, actually, uh, there is only one point in uh, uh, in, in, in M hat, and therefore there is for, for boundary fields, there is only one chiral label, X. And then I can talk also about defect fields, but they are just general uh, generalization of bulk fields, so they will also have uh, two chiral labels. And now, what is uh, the correlators, which I now really want to use uh, to call correlation function? Um, on M, let me just try that. So by M, I need really uh, mean now uh, both the world sheet and any configuration of field insertions and then defects on it. This will be a vector, an element in uh, a corresponding space of uh, conformal blocks on M hat, uh, and uh, if my correlation function, forget about defects uh, uh, for the moment, uh, has say M, bound uh, M bulk fields and N boundary fields, then this will be a 2M plus N uh, correlator, point correlator in uh, on, on M hat, because for 
bulk fields, I have uh, two three images. Well, there is actually uh, always a projection of m hat to uh, to m, so I will have two pre images for uh, any point in the bulk and uh, one for any point on the boundary. And uh, this will be a vector. And now um, this will not be uh, just some vector. It has to have uh, uh, has to satisfy various consistency conditions. It turns out by construction here the conformal blocks. Uh, uh, they are space uh, vector spaces, but not just vector spaces. They come uh, with an action of the mapping class group uh, of of M tilde. Uh, and they are compatible with uh, cutting and, and, and sewing of uh, um, uh, those curves. So uh, specific here means uh, that uh, this is invariant under the mapping class group of M, which uh, can be embedded as subgroup uh, in uh, the mapping class group of M hat, uh, and compatible with sewing, meaning On those maps, I have uh, on 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 those spaces, I have sewing maps which relate um, uh, the conformal blocks on uh, on a given world sheet with with those on the world sheet I get by sewing, and the requirement is that if I take the specific vectors uh, in the unsewn situation, that uh, uh, under that map it's mapped to the specific vector of the sewn world sheet. Well, that was uh, CFT. Now about rational CFT. I... I will be uh, very short. Uh... Well, I can spend a few minutes, I think. Uh, so uh... I uh, have to, to 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 make this concrete. I have to understand, in particular, uh, some parts of at least of the representation theory uh, of of a, of a relevant vertex algebra, and this is in general very complicated. But uh, um, there is a special class of uh, vertex algebras uh, which are called rational vertex algebras. And there's a technical definition uh, of that, which would uh, uh, take some space here, uh, but it corresponds uh, to having S category of uh, modules uh, over the algebra that this has the structure uh, of a model of fusion category. And uh, this was used uh, before, so most of you will, will know what it is, but let me mention it uh, uh, about some aspects anyway. So first of all, it's a category. So you have objects, which I represent by lines. If you have two objects, X and Y, there can be a morphism between them. Uh, and um, if I have uh, morphisms from uh, X to Y and say from Z to X, then I can compose them. Uh, and uh, the uh, axioms are such that these pictures make sense. So notice these are one dimensional. I draw them vertically, but the, the direction has nothing, uh, has, has only the meaning that I start here with X and then go to uh, Z and go to X. Um, and uh, there are identity morphisms, namely, a morphism from x to x, uh, which just gives us back uh, uh, x. And uh, if I compose several of them, then I don't have to put brackets. So there's some associativity. And then um, it's, let me see what the next point uh, I was trying to uh, do is, yes, uh, it's finitely semi-simple.
So uh, up to isomorphism, uh, any uh, object X can be written as a finite direct sum. So I in uh, some uh, uh, index set I, uh, X I up to multiplicity. So. Maybe I write to that, like that. Uh, and um, uh, then um, there is a tensor product, which will play the role of the of the fusion product in So there is a functor from, let's call the category C. There is a, a functor from C cross C uh, to C, uh, which maps uh, X and Y uh, to something we call X tensor Y. Uh, and then uh, this has uh, properties uh, and also a, a, a unit object or a monoidal unit, which I call uh, one, with the property that one tensor X is isomorphic to X and uh, and also X tensor Y. And these isomorphisms have to be coherent in suitable sense. For simplicity, I will uh, take them just to be identities. And likewise, if I take a double tensor product, I have two possible bracket bracketings. There is a, a coherent family of isomorphisms between them. And also those I will take to be identities. Uh, one can do that, uh, that's an important uh, theorem. Uh, then finally, it's a ribbon category, meaning that there are special uh, morphisms, uh, namely uh, there is a strict duality, so there are two dualities actually, uh, which I indicate like that. So to each object X, there is an object uh, which we call X dual and morphisms uh, of this type where uh, these are, so th this should be uh, considered as a morphism from uh, XV tensor X. So horizontally here, I take a tensor product. A ca category is a one dimensional thing. Monoidal category uh, is uh, something two dimensional. Uh, it's uh, actually uh, one element uh, two category, which explains uh, the two dimensionality. Uh, and uh, with this, I mean uh, that I have uh, um, morphism from XV tensor uh, X to the tensor unit, and the tensor unit is invisible because tensoring with it gives us back our object. So these are uh, the dualities. They have to satisfy some properties. I will, will not uh, uh, draw all of them, but let me just indicate it uh, uh, like that, uh, sometimes called snake identities. Or some people who uh, want to be more fancy call them sorrow moves. Uh, then uh, dualities, uh, then there is a, is a braiding. So a definite way uh, of interchanging for going from X tensor Y uh, to Y tensor X called braiding because uh, this has to satisfy relations uh, uh, which uh, you know from the braid group. And these have to be isomorphisms. Uh, and then there are also twists, uh, which I indicate like that. Well, I, I will not really use them, but these are isomorphisms, uh, uh, automorphisms uh, of X, and they have to satisfy certain properties. So for example, the twist of a tensor product is the same as twisting individually the factors and the double braiding. And now the task is, uh, well, the, the setting now uh, will be a rational conformal field theory. So full uh, rational conformal field theory, I will just tacitly assume that I know enough about the chiral theory to address uh, the uh, full local theory uh, directly in terms of the representation category C. That's what you would call the categorical setting or categorical approach. Uh, so I will not tell you what these vectors here, which are elements of vector spaces, how they look as actual functions of the moduli and the uh, insertions. But I, uh, well, I will not tell you, but I could tell you how uh, you express them in terms of 
specific specified basis of those um, um, vector spaces. And uh, that you can analyze. Uh, and the result, I will, I have 12 minutes. Uh, I will um, summarize in a dictionary between concepts, intuitive or physical concepts, namely those which I uh, mentioned in, in uh, parts one and two, and uh, categorical structures in terms of uh, the category C, which now uh, for the rest of, uh, of, of this first part of the talk will be a model of fusion category. Oh, I forgot one, uh, <laughs> that the modeler part, the uh, braiding should be maximally non-degenerate, meaning that if I look at uh, the morphism from the tensor unit to the tensor unit that I get by looking at the double braiding and then taking a trace while the duality, say I and J here, uh, if I take the matrix where this goes over the finite index at I, uh, then this is non-degenerate. So I give you a dictionary between physical or whatever uh, concepts and mathematical, essentially categorical structures. So the setting is that I fix a model of fusion cate uh, uh, category uh, C that I take as given. And then I want to know what various things I talked about uh, are in this context. And the first is what is a phase? It turns out that the phase is uh, the same or is labeled by uh, what is called a something which I have to specify Frobenius algebra. Let's call it A in C. Uh, before filling out uh, things here, uh, let me indicate what the Frobenius algebra is. Well, you, uh, some of you might know algebras as vector spaces with additional structure. You have the same thing in any monoidal category. So an algebra is an object, which I call A, together with two morphisms. It must be in a monoidal category. So I have A, a tensor A, and uh, I have something which I call a multiplication, uh, which goes to A. And there is another map from the tensor unit uh, to A, such that this is an associative product in pictures. Uh, this means this. So from a trivial product of A to A, these two morphisms where here I have uh, everywhere the, the, the product have to be equal. And uh, uh, this map, which is often called eta, uh, is such that uh, if I if I multiply after uh, and, and uh, after taking eta on, on one of the factors, then I get the identity. So associativity and unit properties. Oh, that's twice the same picture, and it's correct anyhow. But I need both of them. And uh, then, if you put these pictures upside down, you get here maps from A to A tensor A. So correspondingly, you get the notion of a co-algebra. And then a Frobenius algebra is an algebra and co-algebra, which are compatible in a specific way. Namely, if you first multiply and then take the co-product, it's uh, the same as these two. Actually, only uh, once given uh, associativity and, well, uh, algebra and co-algebra structures here, uh, one of the equations follows from the other. That's a nice exercise. And then this should not just be uh, Frobenius. Uh, there are other properties. Uh, it should be uh, simple in a suitable sense. It should be special, meaning uh, that the co-product is a one-sided inverse uh, to the uh, product. And similarly, uh, for, uh, for the unit and co-unit, uh, this should be non-zero. Actually, the number has some meaning. Uh, namely, uh, if we look at uh, this picture, then 
not yet, uh, but if we uh, also, which I also require, simple, special, and symmetric. A symmetric Frobenius algebra is the following. If you look, uh, we have a duality, where we have two dualities. So you can look at this morphism from A to A dual, and also at this morphism uh, from A to A dual. Now, uh, in, in fact, this is the right dual and this is the left dual. We have to require that they are actually isomorphic and uh, this uh, essentially uh, means that you use the pivotal structure that you auto automatically have in a model of fusion category. So let me write like, if you include that uh, tacitly, then they have to be equal. And um, from this, it follows that this is nothing but a quantum dimension for a symmetric Frobenius algebra. Uh, yes, the objects of C would be modules and the morphisms are intertwiners. So, so the, is the perspective that C is uh, line operators in a 3D that has this BOA on the Actually, you can show that topological boundary conditions for a Rashid Tikin Toraev type uh, conformal uh, uh, topological field theory in, in three dimensions uh, uh, give you a Frobenius algebra and the other way around. Yes. Well, I don't use that picture, but that's one way of, of thinking about it. Yes. You mean now in the 3D case? I think it's all, but I would have to uh, to think about it. But I'm talking about uh, conformal field theory here yeah, now. So we, we... <laughs> well, if you can prove that, then the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, so what is the boundary condition? Uh, now I have to uh, speed up. Boundary condition is an A module. Uh, so if I have a, a boundary where my uh, 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 my world sheet, the adjacent part of the world sheet is in in uh, in phase A, labeled by a Frobenius algebra, uh, then the boundary condition uh, is specified by an A module. Modules you define analogously uh, as uh, well. <laughs> Uh, as modules of an ordinary algebra. So there is a, it's an object together with an action which is compatible with multiplication and unit. Well, the, these are the labels for, for the top dimensional regions of my uh, stratified manifold. So, so, so if you if you look at no it's not no longer there if you look at uh, at at the conditions you have on correlation functions as specific vectors in space of conformal blocks we have fixed c so the spaces of conformal blocks are fixed now you solve these equations in general it turns out the solution is not unique uh, but there is a finite number of solutions and they are specific well up to certain isomorphisms uh, and then uh, the I, I, uh, these correspond to the different phases of the theory so if I uh, may, maybe uh, give me uh, a half a minute to go to the next line, uh, what is a defect or defect condition? Uh, this is an A A prime bi module called a D. So we have the situation where we have a defect, one dim a line defect. So it separates uh, two regions and they are labeled in general by two different Frobenius algebras. And I say the two regions here are in different phases, A and A prime. And what is a bi-module? It's the left module and the right module with the left and right actions compatible. Well, in, in, in general, when I, uh, when I have an arbitrary world sheet, I will have a, a network of defect defect lines on them, and in each of the of the of the two dimensional strata of the uh, of of, uh, of 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 the stratified uh, surface, I uh, to each of them I have to attach a label, and this label is a Frobenius algebra. Okay. 
understand correctly if there is a different way of doing left and right? Um, uh, a, a different consists well, uh, it 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 gives you in particular the, the this information. So in as uh, as I will not have time uh, to tell you. Uh, is if, if you use all these uh, things, you can actually give a construction of all correlators. In particular, you can look at a, a partition function, uh, and then you will see uh, uh, what combinations of left and right are, are possible. And they are completely specified, uh, uh, can be completely expressed in terms of, of this algebra A. Um, then I also uh, have to look at fields. Let me first look uh, at, at boundary fields. So a boundary field is a, a, a zero dimensional defect which changes boundary condition M uh, to M prime. And this will be an element uh, of a certain morphism space, namely the morphism space of A module morphisms. Um, um, of you can take the tensor product of M of the object underlying M to be precise uh, uh, with uh, X. X is a Kyb label that I have for boundary fields uh, and M prime. So th there will be a space of boundary fields, and you could, uh, of course, say uh, uh, try to turn this into an object actually in your category. This is possible, but I will not do this here. Maybe I have time in the second part. And then uh, a defect field. And I will take one or two more minutes uh, to, to explain this will be an element of the space of, so an element, now I have a defect uh, between, uh, uh, one defect between A and N prime and another defect also between A and A prime. So a defect condition D prime. Uh, and then this will be an element of the uh, space of morphisms, which are compatible both with the left A and right uh, A prime uh, action of the following thing, X tensor plus. So this will have two labels because it's uh, in the bulk, uh, say X and Y. X tensor plus with D tensor minus uh, with Y and D prime. And what does tensor plus and tensor minus mean? I want to have bimodule morphisms. D prime is a bimodule, but uh, X tensor D tensor Y is in general is, is not a bimodule, but I can make it into a bimodule by saying that uh, if I have X tensor D, I act with A on this tensor product by just braiding and then acting on D, and I uh, act with A prime uh, I have tensor product with Y, I, I act with uh, A prime by again using the braiding. And in one case I use uh, over and under braiding, and this is actually related to this uh, to these uh, two sheets uh, of the uh, cover M hat of M uh, that tells you that you have to do it that way. And um, as a special case, uh, of this, you have bulk fields. Well, for bulk field uh, D is just the tensor unit of the cate of, of of this uh, category of A. In this case, you have A uh, prime equal to A. Uh, a A prime bi modules do not have a tensor product. There's a kind of algebraic structure on, on them. But if A is equal to A prime, it's actually a monoidal category. It has a tensor unit. Uh, this is the one. Uh, well, A is the tensor unit of of the category of of A bi modules. And uh, so you would have to put A here and A here, uh, and then you get the space of bulk fields. And then the statement is that doing this um, and uh, using some information about the topological field theory, Rishikin Toraev type, uh, on a, a, a three manifold which has M hat as boundary, you can describe these specific vectors as invariants of ribbon graphs in that three manifold and can show that they are actually consistent. 
and you under some non-degeneracy assumption you can show that every phase of a conformal a full conformal field theory is obtained in that way okay thank you for this part Well, uh, for that I would have to tell you for more de de for details I would have to tell you a bit about this uh, construction. But uh, let me just give uh, uh, mention one uh, one aspect. So if you look if you look at this uh, definition of of defect field let, for simplicity bulk field. No, let me uh, assume we have defect field uh, D and D prime. Now, I have described this in purely categorical terms. If in this construction, I take my three manifold and embed a graph, a ribbon graph in that three manifold where I have uh, lines or well, actually ribbons, uh, but they are flat in the world sheet, which is embedded in the three manifold. Uh, so I have my three manifold here and in, in that three manifold. So for example, if, if, if I have a disk, uh, then the three manifold is really a ball, a three ball. Uh, then I, I I could have a defect line here, a defect line here, and then uh, I have a defect field. It has two chiral labels x and y, and I have to look at morphisms uh, of something from x tensor d tensor y. So I have a line labeled by x and a line labeled by y, and then let's call this uh, psi. I have such a uh, well an element in this space, uh, and now I get uh, 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 the correlator as a specific element in the space of chiral blocks uh, by, uh, in, by specifying a, a ribbon graph in this three manifold. This is not yet the ribbon graph. Uh, these lines cannot just end here. Uh, but what I say is. Uh, this ends on the boundary, and this ends on the boundary. And if uh, this this uh, this is uh, D of uh, well, well, this is uh, M hat. In this case, it's connected. Uh, but uh, really, the two points here are the two pre-images under uh, the projection from M hat to the world sheet M. Uh, to this, I connect this. But then, what do I do with the defects? Well, they also have to end somewhere, and the only possibility is, uh, well, the, the prescription says that uh, it should end on the boundary. So there will, in general, if these are really uh, visible defects, there will be a defect, uh, there will be a combined defect and boundary field here and here. But now let's look at a special case that it's a bulk field. So I just have an A line. And then, it, well, everywhere, he, uh, well, here I have to specify a morphism. This will, uh, the boundary condition is uh, some module M, uh, which comes with a, uh, with a representation map or a row, and the row I associate here. So psi is in this, um, is, is some morphism here. Here I have a specific morphism, uh, and now, uh, in the prescription, I have actually more. I start with a dual triangulation uh, of the world sheet, where each of the lines uh, is labeled by the uh, algebra A, and each trivalent vertex is labeled either by the product or coproduct. Uh, and uh, there could also be one dimension, uh, one one pronged uh, vertices which are labeled by unit or co-unit. And I make a choice. And then I have to show uh, that actually the invariant of the ribbon graph that I get is invariant of this choice. And requiring invariance uh, in, uh, in particular includes the requirement uh, that um, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, that A is 
uh, an algebra and a co-algebra that I have already put in, but in fact, that it's a Frobenius algebra and with, with, with these other properties. And also then uh, I can go uh, with lines. Uh, uh, this goes in the three manifold actually uh, uh, below uh, to the to the bottom. This goes above, uh, so I can also look at at uh, triangulations like like that. Uh, and uh, uh, now this must be again be compatible with uh, choice of triangulation, so I must be able to move this through. This gives us precisely. Uh, the required uh, bimodule structures here. Well, there will be time in the afternoon. I, I should say I have, uh, I have uh, two Zoom meetings. You mean you, one needs uh, little water, <laughs> small water, how you... <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, I, I have not used green and, and this is a joke. <laughs> uh, but you took it away from me. So. Um, so before I come to the to part number four, let me uh, just mention that you might have noticed that I didn't uh, tell you in part uh, three anything in detail about invertible defects and duality defects. But that can be summarized by just saying that before I have described, you can define them. Uh, and then you can do precisely uh, uh, with them precisely what you want to do according to the ideas in uh, part two. Now in part th uh, three, I want to go beyond uh, two-dimensional rational conformal field theory, but I stay in two dimensions and I stay essentially with conformal. Implicitly, part of this will also be about three-dimensional topological field theory, but. Uh, I, I will not point out that actually. The main part uh, will be about uh, beyond semi-simplicity, then I will say a little bit about uh, beyond rigidity, and then very, very little, therefore it's almost invisible, about beyond categories. So why uh, semi beyond semi-simplicity? If a category is semi not semi-simple, it's in particular not unitary, and you can ask uh, uh, for quantum field theory, why would you be interested in that? Well, from conformal field theory point of view, uh, just most vertex algebras have representation categories which are not semi-simple. Uh, uh, important class of models are the so-called uh, PQ, minimal models of the various oral algebra, where you get what is called lower rhythmic conformal field theories. But then you might also want to describe situations which are not ordinary quantum field theory, like uh, driven uh, systems or systems out of thermal equilibrium. Uh, and there is some hope that some of uh, uh, some of this can still be described in categorical terms. But uh, uh, I will stick uh, to conformal field theory uh, and uh, in particular uh, to a class of uh, uh, models which I would call finite conformal field theories, uh, which beyond the semi-simple ones includes in particular in the first place the 1, p, uh, p min uh, uh, minimal models. Uh, and uh, in that case, uh,
What is relevant, it seems, uh, is that I take C not uh, to be a modular uh, tensor, uh, modular fusion category, but uh, not necessarily semi simple uh, modular tensor category. Until maybe 10 years ago or so, uh, this was uh, supposed uh, to be semi simple, but now when one wants to stress semi simplicity, uh, one says fusion category. And what uh, uh, is this in particular? It's a finite tensor category, even finite ribbon category, plus some non-degeneracy condition. And what is a finite ribbon category? It's ribbon in the sense I described, and it's finite in the following sense. A finite category, there, there is some technical definition, uh, which is what you have to use in, uh, when you want to make uh, uh, use of these categories. But uh, one way to describe it, uh, it's equivalent as an abelian category to the category of finite dimensional modules over some finite dimensional algebra. And uh, it turns out that finite tensor categories, so finite categories, uh, uh, which also have a, a, a rigid monoidal structure uh, are uh, 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 very nice, still almost as nice as fusion categories. And in particular, then the modular, there's a notion of modular and uh, the, the non-degeneracy condition looks a bit more complicated. Uh, in, in Remember in the semi-simple case, it was non-degeneracy of this S matrix. Now in the non-semi-simple case, we still have in this case, finitely many up to isomorphism, finitely many simple objects, uh, but the theory is far from uh, described by just understanding those. So, for example, the associator in a semi simple category is uh, 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 even if we, if we take the category to uh, strict, we, we get it back by looking at, uh, at basis and then it's encoded in the 6J symbols. There are no 6J symbols anymore here in the non semi simple case. And um, now you can ask, um, can you describe uh, aspects of uh, conformal field theories where uh, uh, C uh, has this structure? And uh, the answer is yes, uh, and I will give you some results. Uh, but let's, let me first uh, uh, tell you that, uh, But situations uh, are still uh, nice in various respects. So there is a, a there is a good notion of a module category. I haven't used module category before, so I have to do it here. If I have a, a monoidal category C, then the module category over C is just a categorical analog of a module over a ring. So we have an, uh, an, uh, an abelian category M together with an action, which is now a functor, namely a factor from C cross M to M. And a very simple example is just C itself, where uh, the action is the tensor product. Uh, but more importantly for us, uh, whenever we have an, an algebra A, then the category of, a, of right A modules is automatically a left module category over, uh, over C, if A is a, an algebra in C. And also, as Ostrich has shown, under certain conditions, uh, well, any nice uh, module category actually comes from an algebra. And what is more complicated, one can also specify when it comes from a Frobenius algebra. Um, and uh, now, uh, so so, so um, what I also didn't tell you in the first part is that for most aspects, for, for many aspects, in particular for most aspects of the construction of correlators, it's not actually the algebra A that is relevant, but only A up to Morita equivalence. So it's only the Morita class and the module category, uh, which uh, 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 module categories are a way of formulating things in a Morita uh, invariant way automatically. So there is a good notion of module category. 
and also uh, of what is called exact module category. I uh, don't want to define it, but uh, in the semi-simple case, you also want to have your module categories to be semi-simple. Even over semi-simple categories, you can have non-semi-simple module categories, uh, again, similar uh, as for algebras, but uh, you take semi-simple ones. Now, that doesn't make sense anymore here, but there is, an, uh, is a substitute for that. That's the notion of exact module uh, category. Uh, and um, um, some other things uh, which I don't want to uh, specify now, maybe, and one of them I will mention uh, soon. Uh, now, uh, there are two. Now the question is, what, can you still work uh, with those? And there, there have been two uh, approaches uh, in the literature where you get some partial results. Uh, one thing that certainly does not uh, generalize is the relation to three-dimensional topological field theory is for, fa for semi-simple categories, so you cannot use that anymore. So that construction I mentioned uh, cannot be uh, uh, cannot be applied at all. Uh, there is a there is another uh, approach to correlators via string net models that has some chance to generalize to the non semi simple case, but it has not been worked out, uh, and it's not completely clear how much you can do. But you can still do the uh, following. So uh, we we assume that uh, we, we 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 take C or actually I I write now D uh, because some of the statements I will uh, make are for the case that D is actually the Drinfeld center of the chiral category C uh, that uh, I have uh, used so far. By the way. Well, not the not the not the same direct relation uh, that I understand. I see. Thank you. So uh, let me specify not the relation to Richard to of type three-dimensional topological field theories. Um, modeler can actually be defined uh, by saying that uh, S braided categories, the Greenfeld center of C, which I have not defined, and the, the linear product of C and C ref, ref means just opposite braiding and twist, that these are equivalent S braided categories. Uh, which in the semi-simple case gives you back the ordinary definition also, but uh, this holds in full, full generality. So we take C to be uh, a modeler, um, well, uh, at least a, a finite ribbon category. At this point, I don't uh, actually assume modeler. And then take uh, F, F in D uh, to be a bulk object. And I don't define this now, but it, 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 it's, it's something that we expect to correspond to the object of bulk fields in the semi-simple case. In the semi-simple case, uh, uh, remember the space of um, uh, bulk fields with uh, with chiral, uh, given chiral labels was uh, a certain bimodule uh, morphism space. Now, in the same simple case, it's enough to look at simple objects. So let's take simple objects x i. Take the ten, uh, the, the sum over all i. Take these as multiplicity spaces, and in each uh, each multiplicity, uh, each of them being the multiplicity of the uh, object x i box times x j uh, in C cross uh, C ref. Uh, then 
uh, you can show that uh, uh, this is a natural notion of bulk objects. For example, is the dimensions of these spaces, by the way, uh, are just the uh, the entries of the of the model invariant, uh, as you can show. Um, Ah, also maybe uh, this is, uh, that's something which is not so well known. Classification of model invariants is is not a nice mathematical problem, and one reason for that is there are model invariants which do not correspond to consistent conformal field theories. Every model invariant which does actually uh, can be expressed in terms of such a Frobenius algebra. So we we, we do that, uh, and then uh, you ask, can we get Can we impose uh, consistency conditions on correlators where all fields are given by this particular object? Uh, and uh, in order to analyze this, uh, we, we start with some set of fundamental correlators. And uh, concretely, zero, one, two, and three point functions, give them some names uh, and obtain the others on uh, uh, all of them on the sphere and obtain all others. So, in particular, higher genus correlators by what is called the Lego Teichmüller game. Namely, uh, you can, you chop your world sheet into pieces, which are pairs of pants or something uh, simpler. Uh, for each of them, you have one of these fundamental correlators. You put them together with soil maps, uh, which you know geometrically, but you have to make them uh, sense of them uh, categorically. And this is done with the help of uh, certain co-end constructions. Uh, and it can be done. The problem is if you chop up uh, a surface into these pieces, you can do this in many different ways. Uh, getting uh, uh, and and uh, your your uh, result should be independent of that, and imposing independence is uh, uh, part of this uh, Lego Teichmüller game, and um, uh, that's uh, actually something you can do. Um, one uh, problem here uh, that's on the mathematical side uh, structures is. Uh, When you uh, go from, from this situation uh, to this situation, so you, uh, you, you, you chop up your surface uh, locally somewhere, uh, then you know uh, in terms of fields, what you expect is uh, that you get some field insertions uh, on the two uh, parts here, and you have to sum over uh, suitable insertions. And in the semi-simple case, uh, this would be just a sum over i, uh here you would have xi and xi dual where these are now in in d so in the in the conformal field theory context this would be c box times c c bar and and here you just have so uh you you uh insert an object which is of this form a uh, direct sum here this is called uh, sometimes called the handle algebra this has a natural Hopf algebra structure. And if you look at correlators at higher genus, then the relevant conformal, uh, the relevant morphism spaces are obtained from those on the surface by tensoring with this particular object to the power of the genus. And here you have a direct sum and you have distinguished simple objects. None of the, uh, uh, you don't have the uh, uh, simple objects anymore. Uh, well, you have simple objects, but they are not enough. So you need a substitute for that. And the substitute is what is called a co-end. Let me first write it down. It's written as an integral that has some uh, uh, some origin, but uh, it's, it's just a, a, a notation. Uh, and then we say x in C, x tensor x dual. Now, uh, how is this defined? It's defined as a as, as a co-product over all x uh, of, of of these things. So this is a huge object, but dividing out uh, all relations there are. 
In the semi-simple case, relations mean uh, uh, whenever x is a direct sum, uh, I, uh, I, I uh, take away the direct sum, so I end up with simple objects. And also, if I have isomorphic simple objects, I only have to use one representative of the class. And then I'm getting back to this. But in the general case, this is defined uh, as uh, by um, a universal property, namely universal with respect to the following. Uh, this is not just an object. It's an object which comes uh, with a family of morphisms from Y tensor Y dual uh, to here. Let's call them, say, omega Y. Uh, and then uh, in, in graphical terms, what you require is, uh, let's call this uh, L. Or, yeah, why not L? Uh, so you look. Uh, at this omega y, you start from x and say y dual. Uh, you take any morphism f from x to y, then you have a corresponding uh, uh, morphism f dual from y dual to x dual, which you take here. And this should be the same as inserting f itself on the other side. And then here you would have Ah, here you have omega y, you have omega x. These should be equal for all x and y. And then uh, you require a universal uh, property. Uh, so if instead uh, of L, you have such an equal, such families uh, for some other object, then there is a uniquely up to unique isomorphism determined uh, morphism from L to that object. And uh, like, most uh, structures defined by universal properties. Uh, this is very nice because uh, uh, you can uh, uh, you can uh, uh, use the universal property for various things, but it's at the same time very bad because it's very, very hard to to make this more explicit. So, for example, uh, to give a, um, a composition series uh, of of this thing as an object in D is is hard and not known for most cases. There are cases where, where it's easy, but in most cases, it's not. And uh, so uh, among the things which, which are still nice is that uh, the uh, co-end uh, exists. This is defined by universal properties, so there's no guarantee that it ex uh, exists, but in a finer tensor category, it does. But it's, it's, ju it's just a particular uh, uh, case of a of a finite co-limit and and those exists exist. Um, exists. Uh, if it exists, it's unique up to unique isomorphism, and, and that uh, that's a good aspect. Um, and now there is a, a, you you can do this. Uh, oh, you can do a lot of things. Oh no, we started we started a bit late. Yeah, it's fine. As a result, uh, you have a notion of consistent system of correlators, uh, namely uh, they have to be vectors in spaces of conformal blocks. The conformal blocks are now concretely certain uh, the, the uh, uh, morphism spaces in D of a tensor product of Fs with a G-fold tensor product of this L. Uh, and uh, you specify um, um, and, and you require that you have vectors in them which are invariant uh, under the mapping class group, which you can define, uh, and uh, compatible with sewing, which is more or less automatic once you have solved uh, uh, this problem here. Uh, and the result is then that uh, the solutions, so the uh, consistent system of correlators of these Fs are in bijection with structures of commutative um, symmetric Probenius algebras 
on on this object f. Well, this is not quite uh, true. There are two parts. Uh, this this is true uh, if uh, I just take genus zero. If I take the way, if I take away this condition, uh, then uh, I need an additional property, which is called uh, the modular uh, Frobenius algebra. And this is a technical condition, which I cannot show you. It uses uh, the way non-degeneracy here is defined actually in terms of a certain endomorphism of this object L here, uh, which has been given by Lubashenko many years ago. Uh, but it can be formulated, and, and then this is the result. Um, the problem here is that it's not so easy to, to give examples of such structures. If your category happens to be equivalent to the category of uh, 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 modules over a finite dimensional factorizable ribbon Hopf algebra, uh, then you can give it explicitly, well, actually a family of them, uh, uh, of examples. Uh, but uh, in the general case, you would expect that now, well, here actually, uh, 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 D uh, was only assumed to be a finite ribbon category. Now assume D is actually the Drinfeld center of C, where C is finite ribbon uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, even modular. When you expect that you can take F as the so-called uh, full center of A, where A is an algebra in C, in particular, uh, in the same simple case, this gives you uh, the, precisely the, the right thing. There is a special algebra uh, which you always have, let me A, just a tensor unit with all structural morphisms uh, identities. Then this gives you the so-called bulk, uh, Cardi uh, case bulk algebra. But even for A equal one, showing uh, that this object uh, has such a structure, uh, 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 has not been uh, uh, possible uh, directly. Indirectly, one knows it, but there is no no known direct proof. And the indirect thing comes from the following. Um, you can, uh, this is a different approach, and I will just write two formulas uh, about, about it. Uh, you can, instead of uh, saying, uh, you you want to uh, classify such uh, find such structures, uh, uh, which is hard. Uh, you can uh, just try to guess or argue for general formulas for uh, uh, for such bulk objects. And in fact, it turns out it's better to start with boundary objects uh, and then gen uh, general defect objects and obtain uh, obtain. Um, bulk objects as a special case. Uh, for that, uh, you need, oh, I wiped this away, uh, unfortunately, because I wanted to, uh, to, to write this as a formula. If you have a, if you have a, if you have a module category M over a, a, a monoidal category C, you have this action functor, uh, uh, action and then the inner HOM, which is uh, denoted as HOM with a, a under uh, underscore, is uh, the right. One can also look at left adjoint uh, of of this action functor, which uh, means um, uh, that certain morphism spaces in M are uh, naturally isomorphic to uh, morphism spaces involving uh, internal HOM objects uh, in, in C. And uh, one of the other good properties is that internal HOMs exist for finite tensor categories, for finite module, for exact module categories over finite tensor categories. Uh, and then it turns out that you can define a boundary object 
for describing all boundary fields uh, which change a boundary condition M to another boundary condition M prime uh, uh, by uh, the internal hom uh, of uh, M and M prime. And why is this so? Well, we have seen uh, in, in this uh, dictionary, we were talking about uh, uh, boundary fields with chiral label X. They are of this uh, correspond to, to this space, uh, but this is uh, nothing in terms of the module category, the same as a morphism in M uh, of X applied to uh, uh, applied to M M prime. I should uh, maybe you notice I had X tensor M because I worked with left modules. If you want to get a left module category, we have to work with right A modules. Therefore, it's like that. And this now in turn. Uh, by definition of, of uh, a joint functor is the uh, isomorphic uh, to a morphism space in C uh, from X, uh, X to the inner home of MM prime. And then you see, independently of what your chiral label is, you always deal with one and the same object and therefore uh, this object captures, captures all your information about boundary fields. And now the last thing uh, is that in the semi-simple case, you can describe bimodules in categorical terms, uh, in terms of uh, module endofunctors of the corresponding module category uh, that you almost can do uh, still in the non-semi-simple case, but you have to uh, look at right exact module functors from M to M prime. And uh, then the int, uh, this is a, uh, and this turns out to be a module category over the Drinfeld center of C. And then the uh, if you have if you have any two functors G and G prime, which correspond uh, uh, to uh, uh, bi modules and therefore to line defects, uh, you can define uh, the defect object. So the object of defect uh, changing uh, a defect condition characterized by the functor G to one characterized by G prime, uh, just again as the inner home. Now with uh, respect to Z of C uh, of G and G prime. And the non-trivial thing is now that actually you can write this as an end. This is dual to the notion of a, of a co-end uh, of uh, the boundary fields. So this is a nice uh, summary of bulk boundary uh, correspondence. And um, ah, uh, wait, there's no G here. That doesn't make sense. These are homes in M prime between G of M and G prime of M. And um, then what has been done is taking uh, this as an ansatz that this is the right description of defect fields. In particular, when you take identity functors, then you get the bulk fields. And this for boundary fields to see what this implies for correlation functions. And uh, you see that uh, all the requirements you, you, you need for correlation functions at genus zero are fulfilled. Higher genus is not known at the present. I'm already over time, so. Uh, part four two is simply uh, uh, one sentence. Uh, this works or seems uh, seems to cover. It has not been proven, but it has been proven for some of the models for all one comma p models, or maybe it has proven and I don't know it. But uh, uh, it doesn't work for 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 other PQ models. For other PQ models. Uh, one ingredient that you still have here, namely rigidity, is not uh, present. Instead, uh, uh, um, there, there is one basic aspect which is missing. The dual of the tensor unit for rigid duality is always isomorphic, and we can take it equal to the tensor unit itself. In vertex algebra terms, this means that the grade wise dual of the vertex algebra is isomorphic to the vertex algebra as a module over itself, uh, as a module. 
And this is not true for most vertex algebras. And that means most vertex algebras actually do not admit a rigid duality. This should not be surprising uh, when, for, for those who know uh, Yishi Huang's proof of the Felinde formula, because the duality, the rigidity there is, is the hard part. Everything else is much easier. Uh, and then that means uh, you would now try to relax also that. It turns out that there is a nice uh, class of categories where a lot of things can sp still be done. They have not yet been applied to conformal field theory, but there is hope that you can do it. These are called uh, so-called grotendieck verdier categories, where uh, there is a functor which takes over the role uh, of the duality, uh, but it has weaker properties, but still not uh, still nice properties. And then the last part, double categories, I just tell you that everything here was uh, uh, expressed in terms of categories where you have uh, objects and morphisms. Actually, hidden, we have had two categories, via monoidal categories. If you go to higher dimensions, you have to go to higher and higher categories where you have objects, one morphisms, two morphisms, and so on. Uh, but there is also another uh, 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 structure, which turns out to be of interest, namely that you can have at at every le uh, at every level, and I know it only uh, for for the analog of two categories. Uh, you have different two different types uh, of morphisms. For example, take as objects algebras, ordinary algebras. Then there are two potential types of morphisms, namely algebra morphisms, or we have heard bimodules. Uh, similarly, for uh, for uh, bo uh, bo uh, bordism categories, you usually work with bordisms, uh, but you also uh, look at different morphisms and actually you can generalize this uh, to embeddings. And uh, uh, it can be seen that this can, uh, in, in these cases and in others uh, uh, of interest can be uh, covered by uh, what is called a double category, which has two types of morphisms and two morphisms uh, uh, obeying uh, various uh, consistency conditions. And let me just mention that uh, this can be used to understand something about uh, the description of uh, correlators in conform field theory. Thank you. Well, the, uh, if you if you go if you if you admit Grotendieck Verdier structures, you go beyond uh, ah finiteness. Sorry. Uh, um, um, there, I, I would say there are quite a few things known about. Uh, uh, oh, so, so, sorry, I. I um, um, let me see whether I understand correctly. Finiteness in the sense of finite tensor categories, or yeah, like finite uh, number of, of, of ah yes, uh, in in the even in those generalizations, the PQ models, you still have a finite number of the isomorphism of simple objects. If you go beyond that, there are isolated results, but I don't think uh, well, I'm not aware of any good results uh, based on, on on categories, and this is a challenge. Uh, which people are aware of since long, but uh, as somehow the, it will. I, I guess it will still take a few years uh, before you can can. Uh, there is enough knowledge to to approach that. You mentioned that like you have failure of agility for the other PQ models. I guess a phys physical reason. Like, well, like the. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Uh, let me see. Young, young, young Lee model is just a non-unitary. I think it's five. Uh, two five. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, that is a special type. I. I. That. Uh, it, it's not. Uh, uh, young Lee actually is still described by model tensor category, but by a non-unitary one. So there, there is just unitarity. So it's not all PQ models, but some. For example, the two comma three model is 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 the is the. A simplest one. Um, 